Hi. Today I had a conversation with Ashley and she was one of the former members of Third Day Worship Center and she's coming on my podcast to tell her story. I just want to preface this by saying I don't want anyone going and harassing this church on the internet or calling them and saying hurtful things. That's not what this is about. This is about trying to enact change. This is about getting people's stories out and beginning to have a conversation and hopefully starting to enact change. And so with that, I'm just going to say, enjoy the podcast, keep the comments positive, and be kind to one another. Bye. Hello. Um, so I'm here with Ashley, and you were someone who attended for, I think you said three, no, a few months. Yeah, I was only there for a couple of months. Yeah, you attended Third Day for a few months, and I'm bringing her on because she's ready to tell her story. So, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, can we just start from the beginning? With yeah, how, for sure. How did you, well, first, what was your early experiences with religion, specifically Christianity? Um, I, it's all I knew. I grew up in church, you know, I was there every Sunday, <clears throat> if not once, probably twice, um, for the morning and evening service. I used to be a part of the kids church. Um, and I also attended two or three different youth groups at different churches. Like I loved, wow. I loved it. And I always loved the church family aspect too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you always had friends around or, yeah, it was always really positive for me. Yeah. And my parents were a huge part of that. They always brought my sister and I to, they would drive us to youth group and stuff and anything we needed. They were super helpful with that. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah. So my whole childhood and teenage years, I was always very active in church. What was the denomination? Um, Pentecostal or non-denominational. Oh, okay. So you did like the charismatic kind of stuff. Yeah, they were super free and welcoming and you know there was no dress code there wasn't whatever they just took people how they were that's awesome mm -hmm. and where were you living at this time I was living in a St. George New Brunswick just a little town not many people know about it but. and how did you come across the leadership from third day so it was back in 2015 I was taking a break from college. Um, I had some addiction issues going on, so it was best for me to put my studies on hold so I could get the support and help that I needed at that time. Um, the rehabs up throughout the whole country, and even my parents looked into a few of the rehabs in the States, um, but the wait list and like the application process, it was gonna take months to get any sort of help. Um, so I was still attending church with my parents because they always had a rule if we were living in their house, we had to go to church with them. Yeah. Um, so as a young adult, I really didn't want to be going, but they drug me with them anyways. So they said they had this other church or this other pastor from a different church coming in from Ontario. And uh, it was Francis. And he had his whole, his whole leadership team with him there and stuff. And he started talking about the Esther program, and he said that God spoke to him, felt that I should join the program. I explained that I was really struggling with addictions mm -hmm. and uh, that I could use the support. He did explain that the program wasn't specifically for addictions, but for young females just trying to find the correct direction for their life. So, okay. So I was all for it. I was like, you know, I'm obviously not going to get into a rehab or anything, but I do need help now. So yeah. I uh, moved to Kingston. How within like what time frame? So like he approached you at this service. Mm -hmm. And so from that point when you decided to go and from when you arrived in Kingston, like how much time was in between that? It happened really quick. Yeah. It was like, I would say within a week I was there. 
Wow. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot of changes. Like, and it was just you, used. right? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I moved into the Esther program and there were three other females living. Maybe there was four. I think there was four other females okay. living there at the same time. Okay. So what was your um, first experiences with the church like? Because, you know, from what I've seen, they've got a lot of really great ministries going. They've got a lot of things to get people involved and together. And their worship is like, it, it looks like a concert and it looks like fun. I know. That was always my favorite thing was the music. <laughs> yeah, that that's me too. Like I grew yeah. up Catholic and I like just have no time for that kind of stuff. I was also a competitive dancer. So right. I like the kind of modern stuff. So that's what led me to the church that I'm at now. Just the music. Right. I like the yeah. modern stuff. Yeah. And so initially you were happy? Yeah, I I felt super welcome. And like, you know, each Sunday I would show up and more and more people would reach out to me like, oh, you're new here. I haven't seen you before. And they'd, you know, invite me over, say, say they were going to invite me over for dinner to get to know each other. And everyone seemed super welcoming and nice. nice. When did the Esther program start? How soon? Like as soon as you got I moved right in. So oh. it's like, it's a house and we all lived there. So we'd have like different chores to do around the house. We'd have to go grocery shopping. Um, we, we paid rent to live there. Mm. And um, yeah, oh, okay. it, I was 20, I was 23. Okay. Yeah. So, and we were all around the same age. Like we were all in our like early to mid twenties. Okay. So, yeah. What sort of things other than just regular, you know, household kind of stuff did you do at the Esther house? Um, on Tuesday nights, Francis and Edith would come over and I think there were four of us girls all together. Yeah. So one week, it'd be my week, I had to cook everybody's supper, and then we'd serve it and stuff. And we would do like a small devotional and talk about any problems that were going on and just kind of like a check-in type thing. Well, that's nice. So that was, did you yeah. like it? I, I did, yeah. Like, it was really great until it was really bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so. so did you, and you got along with the girls there. In the, yeah, for yeah. sure. They, it was like living with a bunch of sisters. Oh, it that's was an environment. That's nice. Yeah. So you have people coming up to you in services, you know, saying they're going to invite you over for dinner and trying to obviously be friendly with you. What else were you involved in? Um, I went, see, my stay there was so short that I didn't really get to experience too many of the different ministries. Um, but of course I went to like morning and evening services hmm. and I went, they had like a young adults group. So oh, yeah. I went to that, I think I went to that twice, but I was, I was pretty timid back then. I didn't talk a whole lot. And I think actually through this whole experience, I've kind of found my voice. So if one good thing came out of the whole thing, that would be it. <laughs> so you were having a great time. You were making friends. It, you, you were in a good environment. When did it start to go south? Well, <laughs> <laughs> how it happened was the, there was one of the girls that had been there for quite a while. And she really knew like um, the expectations around the Esther program. She, you know, so she was kind of, I guess, my mentor. She was yeah. the same age as me and everything, but she kind of just helped me and also with the addictions part, I was really struggling. And, you know, I moved away from all my friends, everything that I knew into this new spot. I had lived in Kingston before, but I still didn't have like the positive support. Yeah. So this girl, she really stepped in and, uh, you know, we would go over scripture together. We would go for walks and just talk about what a relationship with God is supposed to look like or how it can look like. And me and this girl got really close and so every night like we'd stay up all night talking and like really building a relationship and then we realized it was a bit more than a friendship 
Okay. And we knew that this was really bad. And that if anyone in the church found out, we were screwed. Yeah. So we kept it. We were really good at keeping it secret. And it was so hard because, you know, when you fall for someone, especially in that honeymoon phase, you just want to tell everybody. You want to be excited, right? And it, it is an exciting thing, but for us, it wasn't. Um, but anyways, we were kind of secretly in a relationship. And funnily enough, one day we were in her car talking, having an intimate private conversation. And she accidentally uh, pocket dialed one of the leaders in the church. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh. So, and it sounds like something that would happen on TV, right? Yeah. But yeah. It was real life. And that's when it all came crashing down for us. Um, once we realized, we, we didn't really know if they heard anything, um, but we just saw that she called and the call was ended. So we're like, oh no, we're in trouble. So, so anyways, sorry, before, so you've been hiding this relationship and were you guys afraid that people would find out or were you just kind of? I was terrified. What made you so well, like, afraid and secretive about it? Even like my childhood, like homosexuality is not okay you know if there's two lesbians or two gay guys kissing on tv it's fast forwarded like we don't watch that you don't watch there you don't read books that talk about homosexuality it's kind of like turn a blind eye to it and pretend it's not there um yeah that's kind of how i felt when i was a kid that you just pretend it's not there um going from like one pentecostal ish church to another yeah but then with third day it was like that's the one no no you know they knew i was they knew i struggled with addictions that was okay they were they were willing to support me in that that's good um, and i was even open with them during my time in kingston you know i pursued other things and um things that I'm not quite proud of, but I was open with them about that. And they said it was okay. Like I could ask for forgiveness and it was fine. Okay. And, uh, but as soon as they found out about the relationship with the woman, um, it wasn't forgivable. No. Um, I, so I'm going to take you back and kind of walk you through how it happened. Okay. Um, so like I said, we pocket dialed, unfortunately, so they heard enough. Um, so one of them actually came to the house. I think they picked up the girl that I was with. And anyways, I went into the church and, for one of my counseling sessions. And I was told that somebody was on the phone with my father. Now, I was 23 years old, like I said. My parents had no idea. I I didn't know. It was yeah. my first it was my first um encounter being with a woman. So I was so confused. I was ashamed. And but I knew I was in love. So I was like, how can love be so yeah. shameful? Yeah. Yeah. And um so anyways, I was in and they confront or she confronted me, the counselor did. And I thought up until a couple of days ago that it was Francis himself that called my father. But I decided to call my dad and kind of talk to him about how that was for him. Yeah. Because even though this was five years ago, um, him and I still never had that conversation. And I know it was not only difficult for me, but also for my parents. You know, they knew me for 23 years and then all of a sudden I'm like, this is actually different about me. And I knew that was going to be really hard for them to grasp. Yeah. And it, it really was. They, they struggled a lot. Um, so anyways, I found out that Francis had his secretary actually call my dad. And um, they said, uh, to my knowledge, what they said was that they needed to 
that my dad had to get here ASAP to Kingston or that they needed to get me out of Kingston ASAP. And that's all they said to him? Yes, and that they'd have to find out what was going on with me through me, um, but that I needed to go. So they wouldn't even close what was going on and why it was so urgent? No. Oh, and it was not the, so what did, sorry, just can, what did your dad think was going on? He, He was terrified. Like he didn't know what to think. So he called, he called me and I was crying. I was mortified. Like my father, I thought they told my dad and, um, all he kept, I remember all he kept saying is, it's okay, it's okay, like, everything's going to be okay. I'm like, no, it's not. Like, I'm getting kicked out of the one place that said they were going to help me. And, you know, I was embarrassed. I felt dirty. And I, all I could do was cry and be like, why did we, like, and not that we told anyone, but I was like, why didn't we hide it better? Like, everything would have been fine. Yeah. Just if they never knew, right? Yeah. And, So my dad had a couple of calls, a couple of phone calls with the secretary. And in, on one of the calls, um, they actually made my dad believe that the girl that I was in a relationship was going to harm me. So they, I don't know the exact words that were used, but he was made to believe that she was going to come and find me and hurt me if my parents didn't get me out of Kingston, which is absolutely ridiculous because we were in love (laughs) yeah it was a consensual thing that developed over time a hundred percent okay yeah so that was really messed up and I was like why like why are we adding even more drama to this yeah okay so they what was the time frame from when the pocket dial happened to this confrontation and calling? It was the mom? next day. Oh my gosh, that's really fast. Yeah, it was the next day. So the day that all this happened, um, I was kicked out of the program, effective immediately. Um, no ifs and buts, I was out. Uh, I was no longer welcome back to the church. Yeah. I was super hurt. This was my newfound family, you know? Mm -hmm. I finally, I don't know, going through the journey of being a recovering addict, you strive or thrive on finding people who accept you and support you and love you unconditionally. I thought I had found that. I really did. And, you know, even finding a girl that loved me for even in the middle of my struggles. Mm -hmm. That. And then the next day, you know, I'm just out. Um, you know, the girls couldn't talk to me or they'd get in trouble. So I lost all of those friends, all those girls that I lived with. And it's just done. Like, no goodbyes, no wishy well. Just, it's like I never existed. Did the church. Well, because you said when you had struggled with other things that. Were they, they offered you repentance and forgiveness. You do the whole, you know, and were those things that they offered repentance and forgiveness for worse than what you were doing with this girl? I, so I'm just, I'm just gonna, yeah, I was, I had a relationship with a male. Okay. So it was very short lived. Um, And I truly believe I was trying to convince myself I wasn't gay Mm -hmm. because the more I talked to this girl and the closer we got, it it felt so normal. It felt so comfortable and like, I didn't have to hide anything. And it was just me. Yeah. And that was so nice because my whole life, like I, I dated guys, I was in relationships with, with men and, uh, yeah, this was just different. It felt right. Yeah. yeah I get and that. I didn't, yeah, it felt so right. And, um, yeah. 
I totally just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so your dad's been called. Nobody's allowed you, like you weren't allowed to say goodbye even. No. Um, he just, the message my dad got was I needed to go. Somebody needed to come get me or he needed to get me a plane ticket to go back to New Brunswick. So, um, I, like I said, effective immediately, I was out of the Esther program, no longer welcome back at the church. So I did stay with a cup, a young couple from the church, but I was only there for one night waiting for my plane the next day. And they were super sweet. I remember, I remember just sitting on their couch and I was bawling and the wife, she was so sweet and so like, comforting in that moment Good. but as soon as Francis spoke that you know Ashley needs to go everybody listened like nobody fought for me and I think that really hurt you well, know you were alone your family didn't come with you yeah and, yeah and it's just it's like I had nobody the one person that wanted to be on my side was the one person that I was scared to even go see her because I didn't want her to get in trouble, even though she was already kicked out anyways for being with me. So I was at the couple's house for one night and then my plane was the next day and they had, um, I don't know if it was my dad that arranged it or if it was the church, but one of the church leaders, she actually drove me to the airport. Okay. And, um, so I was at the airport. She came inside to wait with me. And of course we were there like an hour before. So I went out to have a smoke and uh, little did she know the girl that I was seeing was going to be at the airport. She parked like around the side so no one could see her. She messaged me and told me she was there. So I'm like, I'm gonna run out for a smoke. I'll be back in a bit. And then, so as soon as I got to the girl, like we were hugging and crying and we're like, hey, this is, you know, they have to be right because we had so much respect for the leaders that are for the church. And they were like, they have to be right. Like we have, to, it must be us that's wrong. So we were saying our goodbyes. We were never going to talk to each other again. We were never going to see each other again. Like it was final. So the lady that brought me to the airport, she comes out around the corner. She was actually running when she saw us. And um, she starts yelling and like pulls us apart. And she starts pointing her finger right in the girl that I was seeing's face saying, you leave this poor girl alone. Like she's a victim. And I wasn't a victim. I was in love and I mean, I was a victim, but not the way she was seeing it. So mm -hmm. after that, we're like, do you know what? This is crazy. And maybe we're not the ones that are in the wrong. So we pursued it. She actually ended up moving to New Brunswick with me and uh, lived here for a few years. So wow. it, it was super traumatic that sounds traumatic just you know in my opinion just hearing it mm. and I never really realized that it was traumatic until I started sharing my experience with like you know I I work with at risk uh youth yeah and my story has been able to empower them so much and even when I share what you're doing and you know all of this stuff they're seeing how the table is turning so slowly but it is turning you know and life doesn't have to be like this we can't all just get along it you know love is love <laughs> it, yeah well yeah. you said it. it you're like how can something so that feels so right you weren't hurting anybody you were both consenting adults Right. Why would, why would yeah. that need to be broken up? Like, I don't get it. Because in, in their mindset, it's not okay. Which is and within funny. that, I yeah. felt like the dirtiest human being alive. I'm sorry. Yeah. That you feel that way. Like, 
it's not I feel for all the other ones that are going through this yeah because this is happening all over the world yeah and it's not fair not fair you know my my biggest fear is young people are so vulnerable and uh it terrifies me you know I I feel like I was strong in that situation you know as dark as things got and as I experienced I went through depression so much then I'm slowly coming like it's been years that I've been struggling with that yeah and I do believe it's from the constant feeling of like self I didn't feel like I was worth anything and if I could just be shunned away like that with who I thought was my family why would anybody keep me around right yeah but I was able to come out of that but what if there's a young another young person and they're not as strong you know I vouching for them yeah it's it's a scary thing to be alone I've had several conversations with activists and I don't understand I think that because there is religious freedom and that is that's important but mm-hmm. at some point the government needs to step in and start making it mandatory that there are other options for these people because a lot of these kids that go in because they can't be protected and mm-hmm. at some point your religious freedom needs to stop in my opinion when children are being harmed like if you look at Utah for example they're obviously very mormon they have the highest I think it's the highest suicide rate in the United States. Why do you think so that? Why are people asking why? And like, this is why I, I feel like we need to continue to have these discussions because it's not just one church. It's not just one denomination. This is happening all over. And when it goes unchecked, the United States is a perfect example of what can happen. Yeah, I think it's important. This is just the only thing I can come up with. I mean, I'm not a politician. My degree's in phys ed. Like, <laughs> be real. Um, they need to start putting mandatory either pamphlets or, you know, something, books, something, making it mandatory in every kind of denomination, religion, whatnot, that... You need to have other sides because theology is so all over the place. It's so ambiguous and there's so many different interpretations. I think the government needs to make it mandatory that other interpretations be made available in yeah. churches, in mosques, in temples, in, you know, Buddha centers. I don't really know what yeah. Buddhists believe. From what I understand, they're pretty <laughs> accepting, but you know I what I mean? So. Because otherwise, yeah. you're just allowing people to continue to hurt others. And at some point, we need to step in and say, this is bad theology. This is what a different denomination thinks. Mm-hmm. So look at the Anglican Church. Look at the United Church. Those are always yeah. the twos because like, they're obviously very progressive. Mm-hmm. Even the Pope these days. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's changing. Mm-hmm. And we need to show the kids that there are other options. Because if not, they can be so secluded from the outside world. That's how much influence religions can have on community. Sure. They don't know. They don't watch TV. They aren't allowed to associate with friends that they go to public school with, you know? You're so so- And they can claim religious freedom for that, but there's nothing in the Bible that says thou shall not associate with other people who don't believe the same way you do. If anything, Jesus said the exact opposite. Right? Like he was in, yeah. Theologian on your side, government of Canada, United States, wherever else this is happening in secret. Um, And figure out. That's the other thing, like, that's the other thing, in secret, right? Like, if people are denying doing these things, then they must know there's something wrong with what they're doing, right? Absolutely. Like, if they're denying it, and I don't know. It yeah. makes me very, very angry. Yeah. 
And I just think everybody needs to know the truth. Yeah. Because guaranteed, this is not just one church that this is happening in. No, no, definitely. And like, it's not personal. It's the principle behind it. Well, you've said yourself, you've seen what happens when kids don't have the support. Yeah. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish this experience on my worst enemy. Like it was definitely a, one of the biggest events in my life, but it also made me who I am today. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So throughout this whole thing, what else do you want to say to people out there that might be going through something similar or people in the Kingston community or people uh, in Canada in general? That's a loaded question. Isn't yeah, it? I know it's hard. <laughs> um, what, what do you think if you were to speak to a youth right now who might be listening to this and might be questioning or feeling the same kind of shame you went through in their own, you know, school, church, whatever, what uh, would you try to tell them? Just never give up. Even when it seems like, you know, there's no answer, there's no solution, it won't be like this forever. You won't feel like this forever, and it does get better. You just got to hang tight until it does. Mm -hmm. uh, to find somebody that will have your back through it all. Like my big sister, she... You know, we may not talk every day, but I always knew that she supported me and that meant a lot. You know, the ones who do support you, uh, that's unconditional love. Yeah. So hang tight to those people too. Wow. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, people aren't gonna learn the truth unless there's people like you, right? So I, I really appreciate this opportunity to tell my story. And man, if it helps one person, if it saves one teenage girl or guy that are going through this, you know, mm -hmm. it's worth it. And do you have, because I just thought of this now, um, do you know of any resources kids can go to or look into? I know like Kids Help Phone is a pretty big thing but if there's a kid listening to this and they they want to try and access some sort of help do you know of anything well, I don't... in new brunswick yeah. <laughs> i know a bunch um i so growing up like the whole gay thing was taboo right you don't talk about it um talk about it mm -hmm. do it like speak freely and if people are judging you on what you're saying then you don't want to be associated with those people anyways mm -hmm. right so and I think power in numbers I think that's a huge thing so mm -hmm. spend time with like-minded people and um there's something else I was gonna say oh and LGBTQ uh workshops and stuff I know here in New Brunswick actually at my workplace we have them on Fridays and it's just a place for again, like-minded youth to come together, share their experiences and have each other's back because nobody's gonna know what you're going through unless they've gone through it themselves, right? Yeah. So I see it here with our group that meets and even I bring up things I've gone through and I've realized in time how much power there is with using what we've been through. Use your experience and Mm -hmm. Try to empower those around you. Wow. Good for you. Um, yeah. Thank you for coming forward and sharing your story because this is starting to have a ripple effect on people. And I honestly think it's going to empower people across the country. And, you know, maybe if we can get it to the U.S. <laughs> to have people start yeah. talking about their experiences at their organizations or with their families and... Cause it's a bigger well, when you first when you first reached out and like we kind of had our initial talk and stuff and I felt like 10 pounds dropped off me I was like yeah like I felt so much lighter and I was like and I was like what is this feeling 
And I'm like, you know what? It's probably the shame and the guilt and the humiliation yeah. that I've been carrying with me for so many years. And I didn't need to, you know? So thank you for allowing me to, you know, use my voice and use my journey. You're welcome. Thank you for standing up for the youth. It was about time, I think. Yeah. It was time. Well, um, I guess we'll end it here. Thanks again yeah. so much. And again, there's going to be more stories coming on. I've got like a lineup now, but like. <laughs> Girl, there's going to be even more. Yeah. You know, I, it's so powerful listening to someone's story and be like, whoa, if they can do it, I can too. Yeah. And so that's I definitely what... encourage people to use your voice. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you.